My name is Ray Dogum, and I am the founder of Health Unchained. Health Unchained is a podcast where I actually interview entrepreneurs, executives who are using blockchain technology in the healthcare space. Uh, so the podcast is available on all podcasting platforms. And today, our conversation will be about, is titled Medical Moonshots in Space, The Final Frontier. And my honor, honorary guests here, our panelists today, is uh, Pierre Alexander Fernier and Jinwei Coxis. And I'll let them introduce themselves um, whenever they're ready. And whenever the mics are also on. I don't think the mics are on. Um, is this mic up? OK, good. OK, perfect. Thank you. OK. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction. So uh, I'm, I'm going to present a few slides to explain what we do at Hexaskin. So I'm Pierre-Alexandre Fournier. I'm co-founder and CEO at Hexaskin. Uh, I, I still talk about my co-founding role, but it's been more than 10 years now. So we, we've been in business. We've been around for a while. Uh, so we, we started the company Hexaskin as a machine learning for healthcare startup, uh, tackling the problems of how do you uh, chronic disease management, chronic care, and aging in place for people with chronic cardiac disease and pulmonary disease. And, and we were working on machine learning models, studying the literature and all that, and then we realized that there was a problem with data collection. Uh, and, and what you see on the screen right now, it's, it, it's what is used today to collect ECG data uh, from patients at home. So this is a setup, a setup. you see all the tape that's for holding the cables so they don't pull on the electrodes. And that's for 24-hour tests. When we talk about chronic care, uh, chronic disease management, it, it's all year long. And we're asking patients to wear that for a few weeks, for a few months, uh, they quit. It's, it's, not, it's not acceptable for them. Uh, they'd rather not be monitored. So, and it, there's a good reason for that. It's because these devices were not designed uh, for long-term monitoring. So what we've done, if we go to the next slide. I don't know if you, you have a clicker or does a click door. Yeah. So what we've done is we, we've replaced uh, the, the Holter ECG with a smart shirt with uh, textile-based sensors in them. Uh, and we've added also respiratory sensors and activity uh, sensors so that you can replace what you see on the left by a smart shirt like the one I'm wearing right now under my shirt. Uh, and my shirt uh, right now talks with my phone, uh, so I can see my vital signs on my phone, and my phone can send it to our servers for analysis, and then the results, the summary, can be put in my electronic health record for my medical team to consult. And this is happening while I, I'm on stage right now, and it's happening uh, you know, wherever in the world where I have an internet connection. Yeah, and Sorry to interrupt you, but are we not able to get the cell phone on the screen? Uh, no. Okay. Well, it's okay. I can, it's okay. Right. We can show people after the panel no if problem. they want to. So if we go to the next slide. So there, there's many use cases for that. There's you know, chronic care management, post-acute care, uh, clinical trials, clinical research. So we've invo we were involved in a bunch of these things. One of these use cases is uh, monitoring astronauts in space. Um, so uh, the astronaut time is very precious in space, and there's very few astronauts that we send into space every year. There, there, there'll be just a dozen this year. So there's very few opportunity to gather physiological data in microgravity. And we need to collect this kind of data to prepare for long-term space missions, when we're going to go back to the moon, when we are going to plan a mission to Mars. Because there's a lot of things that we don't know about physiology in microgravity now. And there's very few data points we can collect. So what we've done uh, last winter, actually, so uh, we've installed a system in the International Space Station for astronaut vital signs monitoring. So the system that you see on screen is, was installed by David Saint-Jacques uh, in January. Uh, it monitors uh, not only the EKG and breathing and movement like my exoskin shirt, but it also attracts uh, PPG, SpO2, skin temperature, and systolic blood pressure uh, continuously. So you have continuous blood pressure measurement, PPG measurement, ECG, and all that coming from a system that's non-intrusive. So astronauts can still run their experiments. They have their hands free. 
they don't have cables in the way of anything, so they can keep doing what they're doing in the space station, but they, they're recording precious uh, medical grade data uh, in the space station. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, so we're, we're doing a bunch of uh, research projects too with these shirts. Uh, so we're uh, going into virtual clinical trials, decentralized clinical trials. This is one that, uh, this is one project that I really like that is run by Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, in it's with uh, uh, patients who have uh, Rett syndrome, which is a very rare genetic disease that affects about 2,000 people in the US. So to recruit patients, you automatically have to go multi-site. And uh, in the first cohort, they recruited 20 patients in six different cities. And they've built the largest physiological uh, database uh, for this disease in the world because they've recorded the, these, uh, these patients for many months, 24-7. Uh, uh, so, so we hope that this kind of project would help develop new cures, new treatments, and better understand uh, these diseases so we can, we can help these people. So to go back, yeah, so, so, so my last slide, uh, no, that, that's after that. No, the other Wait, way. Forward? Uh, yeah, yeah, last forward, last yeah, yeah, forward. Uh, okay. So, can you show the slide number four, uh, slide number five, sorry? Yeah, okay. So, so, but the end game with all that is that we want to, we, if we want to build AI models for medicine, we need to somehow lower the cost of data. And to, to be able to have enough data and do data fusions to build autonomous medical systems. Uh, this is not going to happen this year or next year, but this is something that we need on one side for space exploration and on the other side to take care of our aging population uh, to automate as much as possible cognitive tasks that we're doing uh, on patients because right now the costs are mostly labor costs. So we want to automate cognitive tasks. We need to digitize the patient and we need to lower the cost of that. And this is, this is what we're doing at Exoskin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pierre. So now we can go to Jen's slideshow. Sure thing. And you know, it's really interesting, Pierre, because what you're building is something right now for kind of astronauts, but also there's so much applicability for humans on Earth, here on Earth, uh, for this type of tool. Um, we'll get to some questions, and I don't know if you had a kind of well, the astronaut mar market is a very niche market. Yeah. You know, the, the, there's only a few a year. So, but we're, we're, we have uh, thousands and thousands of users who wear these shirts, collect data, either for personal reasons or because they participate uh, in a research project. Uh, and uh, next year, uh, we're going to have a FDA clearance on our next generation of smart shirts. So doctors will be able to prescribe these shirts for home monitoring uh, post-acute care. Perfect. All right, um, and Jin. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you still enjoy your time here. And uh, I'm Jin Wei Kosis. I'm a assistant professor from Purdue University. And I work in the Department of Elect uh, Computer and Information Technology. And uh, today I would like to share some of our research results for the project of the uh, blockchain-enabled uh, uh, artificial intelligence computing paradigm. And overall, this project is supported by the NASA um, Earlier Career Award. And um, okay, the next slide. So this is kind of what outline of the of my talk. First, I provide some motivation why we want to do this work. And the second is I propose our um, developed computing paradigm and then the potential applications and the final remarks. So next, next slide. Yeah, the first the motivation. And overall, it's uh, because the advances of computing, sensing, and the networking, the data-driven solution already become a very promising solution for different uh, application fields, such as the smart energy system, right? critical infrastructures, and the intelligent transportations, and healthcare, and so on. 
However, because the computing devices or resources owned by the individuals in public nowadays still has a very limited computing intelligence and computing power, therefore most of them still rely on the centralized uh, cloud vendor in order to maintain their data to processing their data. So it is okay for, you know, where on Earth, it is fine, but that's a big challenge if we think about in deep space. In the deep space, all the spacecraft or satellite has really limited computing power, memory, and uh, computing intelligence. For example, for the NASA, they do some small body studies. They can collect uh, tons of data in deep space, but they basically just abandon them in deep space. The reason is they don't have enough power to process that. And it's very costly if they want to send that to the base station on Earth and then to send back the decision. The reason is, for example, they send from Mars to Earth, they need uh, 20 minutes, just one way. And then you have to feel it's lucky enough, you know, when you send, you exactly receive that in the assigned window. Because if you, you miss that window, basically your data sent for nothing. So therefore, basically it's a cost you send, and in other words, to say that is, if you have some emergency happened in the deep space, you don't have enough time to address those issues in real time, potentially can, can cause very critical situations. So because of that, I think why not we try to, it's still the back slides yet? <laughs> Sorry. So why not we, uh, okay. the, the private, the, the, yeah, this one. So how about we try to think some way, just uh, using the NASA deep space, this as an example, how about we find some way can precise those data in real time in deep space by leveraging all the potential spacecraft or satellites, which has a certain ability to processing data, although those capabilities are very limited. But now there will come another issue of security. Because you cannot guarantee all the spacecraft, all the satellites you can see nearby is owned by NASA. It potentially can owned by the other countries, such as Russia, such as China. Doesn't mean they, they are malicious, just means the trustworthiness is kind of low. So the overall, the essential idea of this project is how about we leveraging the blockchain technology, smart, um, and the Internet of Things, and also the software defined network and machine learning to develop a decentralized and cooperative computing system which able to enable a very effective collaboration amongst the computing nodes which potentially has a limited computing power, limited computing intelligence, even though they can potentially untrustworthiness to each other. So that is the general idea of what we want to do. So next slide. So next I began to talk about some detail of our work. Next, yeah. So this is kind of give you a big picture. I know it's a very difficult to write the small letters in the, in the, in this, uh, par the, the applause, but the general idea here is we try to create a effective collaboration or cooperative computing paradigm enable the scattered computing nodes can collaborate with each other even though they not trust each other. And those computing nodes can play as one of the three roles. Potentially can be application initiator, can be the computing contributors, they also can be the verification contributors. The application integrator basically they can um, broadcast their tasks, basically ask for help through this kind of decentralized computing platform in order to broadcast that they basically need to categorize the, their tasks in a nice format. How they categorize? They categorize the objectives and the constraints of their data driven task by characterizing input those information into the small con smart contract in blockchain. By doing so, no no one potentially can manipulate the task in, you know, without uh, awareness. And then they'll push some data to think that other collaborators might need those kind of data into the um, off-chain decentralized storage place. For example, IPFS, because that is supported by blockchain, the immutability, in other words, the integrity security also guaranteed. 
And then after the broadcast in the blockchain, the computing contributors basically are willing to participate in this task, will join that, and then begin their local training by using their private data or data shared by the addiction initiator according to the constraints and objectives already characterized in the smart contract. And then after the train, the fuel is good enough, they will claim in the blockchain at that time, another type of a player, which called the verification initiator, will kick in and then to verify the value of those claimed model. If the verification is a positive, they will inform the addiction initiator, who will fuse all those state, um, local learning model, which has a good value and achieve the metal model. The metal model basically is a much more advanced computing model to address their, their problem in a much effective way, rather than rely on the central cloud vendor and so on. So that is the general idea of this one. So uh, next, please. So here is uh, we already developed the prototype, the hardware in the lower prototype to uh, realize this thing. Basically, the overall the prototype show the picture down. It's a much larger scale. We just uh, characterize here is the part of them. So basically, that has an individual um, computing node. Some is just a Raspberry Pi. We know that has a very limited computing power. Some is the NVIDIA GPU, embedded GPU, and those is, uh, represent the uh, computing nodes. And then and they basically, that is the first layer, the decentralized computing layer, and in the middle layer is the blockchain to guarantee the, um, the privacy and the, uh, the blockchain together with homomorphic encryption to guarantee the privacy and the security. And the last layer is the software-defined network enabled peer-to-peer -peer networking to enable the resilient communication systems. And then we already we worked with uh, NASA Glenn Center already for two years. And we have testing our system, our prototype, by using the data provided by the Glenn Center. And this year, at the beginning of this year, we're talking with them to see how we can integrate our thing in their testing system. Currently, the has a testing system has a three cube satellites. And we're looking into how we can integrate that into the system in order to verify the performance more practically. So the next slide, please. So next, I talk about the potential application. Again, I believe the future of the computing, again, it's only my opinion, it is cooperative computing. Because I believe people need to claim the ownership of their data, try to make the value of their data, make the value of their computing intelligence, rather than all try to contribute that for nothing to the cloud vendor. Therefore, I think the cooperative computing is the future of the computing, which is not only applied to the NASA deep space, can using all kinds of application. For example, the connected uh, healthcare, because we have so many heterogeneous um, devices for the healthcare and the like uh, heterogeneous data we can use, we can leverage uh, those data potentially. It has a very sensitive, very need a pri um, privacy preservation in order to still want to make the value. Another one is the smart manufacturing, because there's all kinds of manufacturing nowadays need to collaborate in order to make the big value and then the smart city. So next, please. So at last, the remark. So again, I view my work like a tree because the, the top of the tree basically leaves is the cooperative decentralized the deep learning. Basically, you miss one computing node, miss one part, it's fine. But if you want to keep the house of the tree, you cannot really move, like, uh, remove or lose all of the, all of the leaves. Therefore, you have to have more than enough leaves to enable to make the survive of this tree. So, and, and then I think the middle part is the blockchain because the branch, because that branch is kind of connected between the physical world and then the data. You have to make sure the branch is trustworthy enough, is healthy enough to make all the information uh, transferred in a high trustworthiness. At last, uh, we have to make sure the physical support is good enough, is reliable, robust enough. Therefore, we, our part is to develop this kind of software-defined network based uh, peer to peer resilient networking. That's it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you both so much for presenting that work that you've been doing. Obviously, a lot of real-world applications that are going on here with, with blockchain and with telehealth, uh, with the Hexoskin suit. Um, I have many questions for both of you. I kind of wanted to quickly start with Jin just because it's fresh on our mind. 
Uh, the first question that comes to mind is, when you think of blockchain, a lot of people think of a lot of computing power, you need a lot of space, you know. If you're going to say that satellites are getting smaller and smaller, is it, is it sustainable to put the blockchain in satellites in space? Yeah, I think so. So I think the, when we talk about blockchain, a lot of people think about Bitcoin, mm -hmm. which is a really is a, the first a good a successful example of blockchain. But here when we talk about blockchain, it's more we talk about the backbone of the technology rather than the application layer. Therefore, it really depends on what kind of uh, consensus protocol we talk about, whether we need to make sure all the computing or it's necessary to make all the computing is happened on-chain rather than off-chain, all those questions is enabled to uh, address it properly based on the application we focus on. A quick follow-up, which protocols are you currently utilizing? Currently, we're using the proof of uh, um, work. That is uh, for the testing, but we kind of switch to the proof of authority. Although I know proof of authority is a, need, uh, the, is a permission um, blockchain, but because currently we're talking about in the deep space, so that is a appropriate justified study, but that is an, it's really is the task driven or application driven. Interesting, yeah. thank you. Um, to Pierre, I have a question for you regarding the Hexo shirt because I'm actually curious about getting one myself. How many times can you wash it? So, so we test them to so that it, it works properly and it it's wor it works as new even after 50 washes, which is way more than than you would wash any piece of clothes that you have in your wardrobe. And would you have to charge it? How long does the battery last? Yeah, so there's a, there's a small device that connects on the side, uh, and and the battery lasts up to 48 hours. Interesting. Um, so, you know, there's this mission to the moon in 2024, and you're probably both working on it at some level degree. Uh, how involved are you with that mission right now? Are you trying to get more involved? Uh, well, yes. Yeah, so, so I, I cannot disclose everything, but right now we have this monitoring system in the space station that is the, the monitoring system that NASA uh, and other space agency use uh, uh, the Canadian space agency, the European, the Japanese would use it as well. And it's, I mean, we've invested, well, the space agencies invested millions of dollars and years in making it space grade so that it could fly. So we hope they reuse the same system to go to the moon with the Artemis missions in, in 2024, uh, 2024, yeah. Are you also involved with that mission in any way? Uh, currently, we're talking with the NASA Glenn Center and the other NASA Research Center to look into what kind of role we can play for this, this uh, big task. Interesting. Um, a question for you, Pierre. What kind of issues can a human get when they're in space? Because you know, you, we like to think of astronauts as superhuman. They'll be fine. But they're being exposed to a lot of radiation they're alone in a certain space with the same people so there's also a lot of mental health issues they might be um, experiencing so what kind of you know conditions could astronauts face yeah so there's many things there's radiation on one side uh, that has effects that we we know about uh, uh, there's microgravity uh, microgravity changes the fluidic of everything in your body uh, and your body was not didn't evolve for that uh, and that cause uh, problems similar to aging in astronauts, meaning they, they develop uh, bone loss, muscle loss. Astronauts typically train uh, over two hours a day just to try to keep their muscle mass, but that, that's not even enough. They're, they're still losing weight. Right. All the fluids move uh, in the upper body. They have uh, intracranial uh, pressure problems, uh, uh, visual problems, ocular problems. And then you have the problems of sleep uh, in the space station. Sure. Because there's no real day and night when you're up there. You're going around the planet 16 times a day. So you have 16 sunsets every day. You don't know when you should be sleeping or not. Uh, so they have a lot of problems with that. Uh, sl using sleeping pills is, is, is common uh, in the space station. Uh, so and this is, this is another thing that we'd like to study uh, in space. So how do you sleep in microgravity? So there's a lot of talk about AI during this conference and just in general in the industry. Why can't we put some sort of autonomous AI medical doctor on these spaceships? Well, the, I think the main reason is we don't have enough uh, data points still to automate most of what we want to automate with an AI, uh, especially when we talk about uh, 
physiological data points in space. We only have, we've sent a little bit more than 500 people in space over the past 60 years, and that's it. That's a very small population, and, and, and we, we don't know much about long duration uh, space flight. But even on Earth, when, you, when we talk about completely automated medical system or uh, medic, uh, an AI doctor, uh, we barely started digitizing patients. We just started with EHRs. Uh, and EHRs don't have enough information to play the role doctors play in our lives. So we probably need to record a lot of data for a lot of time uh, before we can have a, an AI doctor that can do even, even basic tasks uh, correctly at the level a doctor does. I, I'm, and I'm not talking about specific application in, in radiology, for example. I'm talking about uh, a, like a an physician, assistant, yeah, like, like a, a primary care physician. Medical, yeah. Um, that makes sense. Um, so it's, I'm sure it's quite difficult for you to choose which markets you want to get into. The suit seems very, or the shirt seems very applicable to many different types of people. How do you as a company select which markets you want to enter? Well, we, we do like doctors do. I mean, we, we serve the markets where there's demand and where there, there's payment and funding and all that. And right now, we'd like to do more prevention. Uh, right now, the, um, well, most of the money traditionally goes to acute care, to hospitals. Right now, there's some money going to chronic care management, to post-acute care and rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. I think these are very interesting space. There's a lot of gains to be... Uh, obtain uh, uh, implementing correct programs for rehabilitation and chronic care management. I think uh, the, the U.S. can save hundreds of billions of dollars. Maybe not save, but at least reallocate these resources to, to other important problems. Hmm. Uh, so that, that's where we're going right now. So the, the post-acute space, uh, rehabilitation, and uh, chronic care management. Interesting. I don't know if Jun, you had anything to add to that question, uh, just in general, how AI can be included in space travel and, and just in general how AI is evolving or how it is evolving in the industry? Yeah, I think uh, the AI definitely is a very attractive point, but we need to make sure when people in deep space reliability, safety is first a priority mm -hmm. rather than how fancy the AI can, the autonomy can achieve. Another thing is when the AI, if we really process the data locally, that's fine, but if we potentially need a different AI to, to basically need to communicate with each other, we need to be very, very careful about the communication inference and so on. That is kind of different story, but that is kind of a potential um, communication call, communication inference, those things we need to think. Interesting. And as I understand it, sometimes there could be a delay with the transmission when you're in space, when you want to speak to someone on Earth, obviously, it could take... <laughs> 20 minutes or depending on how far you are and you know we get angry when someone's not able to hear us immediately so I'm thinking you know how is how is how are you working on um, helping the industry with that kind of well, that, obstacle? That, that's an interesting question and that's one of the reason why we're working on the architecture of a, a, an autonomous medical system or an AI for, for space is that uh, with the International Space Station, astronauts do telehealth all the time. The, each astronaut has an assigned uh, flight surgeon on, spa on, on, on the ground that they consult on a regular basis. And they have other specialists that, that, consult, that they consult with because the delay is manageable. Uh, but if you go to Mars and even on the moon, uh, you know, the back and forth is many seconds. It makes it harder to sustain a, a conversation. And then on Mars, it can be up to 20 minutes. So you cannot have a conversation if there's a 20 minutes delay on each side. So you have to, you have to build a system that can support the, 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 the crew members uh, during these flights. Especially since right now in low orbit, you can ship back an astronaut uh, on Earth and get, get them to an operating room in about six hours. There's a protocol for that. But if, if they're on the moon, uh, it takes days to have someone come back. And so we absolutely want to prevent any acute situation where we would have to abort a mission or send an, a send an astronaut back to Earth. Interesting. Uh, Jean, this question is um, more targeted for you. I was doing some research on this industry and the satellite industry, and it looks like um, many of them are refusing to use cloud-based services for data management. So that's just cloud-based. That's like 
pre-blockchain kind of stuff, technology. Um, so do you feel like it's going to be a struggle to have the industry adopting blockchain because they're still working through the cloud-based adoption? I think a blockchain, I view that as a next generation of the computing because it is, uh, it, I think it's a little bit different from the cloud-based because cloud-based is more like a centralized. Mm -hmm. Basically, the cloud vendor who support that cloud infrastructure has all the basic rights on the data and on the processing. But the blockchain basically gives people their ownership of the data, the, the, the privacy of their data, and then they are able to make a value of that. I think people kind of refuse to use that. It's because of the trustworthiness and also the, also the privacy. Mm. So I think this blockchain can help to, to address that issue. Interesting. Mm. Um, I want to make sure we have enough time for questions from the audience. Um, so does anyone have any questions at this moment before I kind of jump? Yeah, awesome. I can hand over this mic to you, I guess. <laughs> Thank you guys, fascinating stuff. Uh, my name is Patrick Ayel, I'm with uh, Athena Health. Um, I had a, a quick question for both, both of you, uh, kind of on each one of your topics. Um, when we're talking about the satellites, right? What is the, and I'm just imagining the scenario, right? You're in deep space and we're using these satellites to do processing, right? Um, the distance that you would save would be the distance from the satellite. So instead of sending signal from the space station to Earth, that time that would typically take today, right? You're saying do that to the satellites that are in orbit, right? What's the just general ballpark efficiency increase in, in that reduction in distance? Because I'm trying to understand the the benefit to doing it there instead of the uh, the cost of sending it completely all the way to Earth. Does that My make, question, yeah, that's for you. Yes, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So I think that it's a, it's a really we need to look at that in different pieces. Yep. The first, if we let's say if I want to send send the all the information from satellite to the to the on the Earth. Yep. Okay. So if we send, for example, from the from Mars, so around the Mars, so that way basically it take twenty minutes one way and then 14 minutes, two way. And then also, basically in the base station, it's not like you receive any time I can process. They basically assign the different processing window associated with the different spacecraft or satellite. So basically, when you send, you miss that uh, window. Mm -hmm. So basically, you cannot even receive that data. Or even receive, you will, no one will process. Because nowadays, the, the control center is not that uh, autonomous. It's not as an, it's a still based on human. So basically, human, they, their operators assign the windows. So that is, uh, I think from this two piece, definitely, if you are able to processing the data in just uh, in the deep space rather than send it back, it's a big benefit. Another thing Window is the, tremendously at that point. Okay, exactly. Another is the payload. Yep. Basically, the data we can collect, especially I attend some panel for the, for the small body study, they can really achieve a we can more than we can imagine how much data they can collect in deep space. And all of them are very valuable for the, the certain studies, but those data is impossible even send back. Let's forget about the delay, it's just amount, it's difficult to send back. Uh, another side question to that is, how would the economics, have you thought about how the economics would work? So say you have a Russian satellite doing processing of American space station data. Um, they're not gonna do that for free. How, how does that, is this going to take resources on their side? Has, has there been any thought to how the economic model might work for that? The good point. That actually, this is something we're looking into. How we can get a good uh, incentives, so so basically can incentivate the people who would like to participate in this kind of cooperative computing. So that is kind of a little different story. So here is kind of more from the computing perspective. That is how you design the smart contract. So make because smart contract is kind of enforce the policy. So how you design smart contract in order to realize a certain policy that people are willing. To, to join participant. So we're currently looking into the game theory, the contract theory to design those systems in order to make sure they can achieve a good equilibrium for the overall collaboration. Awesome, thank you. And, and for the, the wearables, um, I see tons of application for you know, uh, cost savings to be created and when you think about you know, prevention, right? Especially with a lot of uh, quality contracts out there now becoming more, more away from people service. Yes. So, um, 
when you're looking at kind of the larger market, um, you know, what are the big competitors that you're going to be facing? Because I'm just thinking off the top of my head is, is the, you know, you know the iKit, right? Uh, they have created a lot of devices that are integrated into their iKit, and they've created a kind of a centralized repository for this. What are your thoughts on competitors in, in, into that market? Um, and the second um, part of that is, you know, what is the, the connection strategy when it comes to, you know, because you, you have to take the data and it has to be presented to a physician in a usable setting, right? There's a million different systems out there and the barrier to actualize that data from the device into the usable care setting is gonna be a, um, it's gonna vary of complexity, right? What are thoughts on that as well? Well, I, I think the key is workflow integration. Um, if you provide a solution for chronic care management or for post-acute care, it needs to be integrated or in the workflow that, that physician, nurses, and the care teams uh, uh, work within, <clears throat> or at least you, you need to manage change in a way that it doesn't require too much training and effort to adapt the new workflow. Uh, and, and on the integration side, I think uh, the integration with an EHR is key because you want that, that's where uh, everybody shares the information today. Uh, and, and what we hear from physicians and their team is they don't want to log in into 17 different systems to take care of their patients. They want everything at the same place. And it makes a lot of sense. And we, we integrate with EHRs, uh, and, and that's our goal to support that. Uh, we don't want to replace people. We don't want to replace the EHR. We want to provide a supporting technology so that they can deliver uh, the, the, the care at home and keep patients at home. So in regarding competitions, there, there's a few player right now. I don't think Apple is a, is a player in the space uh, because they, they, they have d not done anything for workflow integration specifically right now. But it might change in the future. We'll see. I think what we do is pretty unique, though. Uh, we do things that you cannot do on the wrist. So long-term EKG, you cannot do that on the wrist. Uh, breathing pattern monitoring, you cannot do that on the wrist. And we have very good literature now showing um, how good the, the patient adaptation is with the smart shirts compared to other technologies and how precise the measurements are for ECG and also for, for the various lung disease like COPD. Very good. Um, do we have time for more questions? Maybe afterwards. Uh, maybe afterwards. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Thank sure. you. <laughs> the 2019 Converge to Accelerate conference is brought to you by IEEE, the world's largest technical professional organization for the advancement of technology. Bollinger Ingelheim, passionately working to improve healthcare. NASCO, advancing digital health together. Ipsy US, the Association of Independent Workers for one, for all. Partners in Digital Health, publishers of the forward-reaching blockchain in healthcare today and telehealth and medicine today. Special consideration to iWorker Innovations, taking the independent workforce to new heights. Connected Health Conference, designing for healthy habits and better outcomes. Haven Health Solutions, providing true blockchain transactional interoperability. Special thanks to Seaport World Trade Center for hosting us. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away.